Uh, we heard you over the weekend express your hopes that Saturday would be enough and that maybe demonstrators would decide to leave, but, but they haven't. We're now uh, hearing, as you know, promises that they will stay until all COVID mandates and measures are dropped. So how does that make you feel hearing this on a Monday morning? Well, we're actually seeing some of the trucks uh, starting to move out and, and go back, uh, I assume, back to work and back to their hometowns. And that's the message I've been consistent in giving, Michael. It's, you know, you've had your protests, you've had your rallies, you've been honking your horns for 48 hours plus. It's time to move move on and let our city uh, regroup. Uh, we're dealing with COVID. We're dealing with um, uh, challenges with uh, temperature and snow. And the last thing we need is for this thing to linger on. And, and quite frankly, I think uh, they're losing a lot of public support when they, they have members of their uh, gang that go out and urinate on the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier where Corporal Cirillo was killed several years ago uh, guarding the tomb and the cenotaph. Uh, when they go to a soup kitchen, uh, the Shepherds of Good Hope, and demand free meals taken away from the homeless. And when they drape uh, you know, an upside-down Canadian flag on, on Terry Fox's statue, the public are saying, you know what? Uh, you're, you've lost the room, as they say. Uh, one of our columnists in the Ottawa Citizen, Kelly Egan, uh, wrote that uh, just earlier today. So, you know, my message is: look at people live in the downtown. They're they're sick and tired of the diesel fumes and the honking of the horn. Their kids can't get to, to sleep. They feel they feel uh, fearful. And uh, the same with our business community. You know, today, as you know, Michael, is the first day restaurants can open up again at 50% capacity and cinemas and so on. And many of the small businesses in the downtown are afraid to open up. That shouldn't be the case in, in a civil society like ours. Well, I'm going to ask you to draw perhaps more of a picture here, because as you say, we, we've heard about these incidents, for example, at the soup kitchen, at the National War Memorial, the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, not to mention the Terry Fox statue. But this is also a vibrant downtown core where thousands of people live. What has it been like for them living through this demonstration? What are they expressing fears about right now? Well, uh, a couple of things. You know, we've had a number of occasions where people have been intimidated and yelled at for wearing a mask outside, which is the, the right thing to do. Uh, it, you know, it just um, is illogical. Their even their their theme of coming here to fight uh, for freedom. Uh, you're fighting against some of the rare tools we have to fight COVID-19: wearing a mask, social distancing, getting double vaccinated, and then the booster shot. And uh, people, I think you used to live in center town, if I'm not mistaken, Michael, people live in the downtown. It's not just a bunch of government buildings. Uh, they live there. They go to schools there. We had to close one of the schools for fear of uh, safety. Same with the daycare center. Uh, and, and the organizers have not once condoned uh, anti-Semitism with the Nazi symbol or Confederate flags. They should be ashamed of themselves. And at the end of the day, uh, they're not getting any public support. It's dwindling, quite frankly. So I think it's time for them to move on. And some of them have got the message. Some have started to clear out. But the rest of them should be on their way and go back to their hometowns, talk to their local MPs. It's a federal issue of, of, um, of a mandate. And uh, allow our city to regroup and um, start to um, open up again for the residents and for the tourists and the visitors and the people that work uh, here in the nation's capital. You know, the Byward Market has been impacted, Centertown. The broader downtown core and um, I think it's time for them to, to move on because they're they're losing credibility by the hour. Mm -hmm. And you're right I did Somerset and Elgin to be exact. Uh, listen I, you mentioned the the businesses in the capital city and I'm wondering what has this protest meant for the local economy and people just trying to make a living and trying to get around right now? Well as you know even before this protest started uh, on the weekend um, a number of our businesses were, were suffering because of the lockdown. You think of the restaurant industry, gyms, uh, movie theaters, and so on. And so they're already uh, up against the wall. And the last thing they needed was, you know, for instance, the Rito Center, which is our largest downtown shopping center, is closed now for the third day. Just think of the uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that are being lost, uh, the number of jobs that are affected. You know, you're working minimum wage at a fast food restaurant in the food court. And, um, you know, you're not able to get paid because the, the protesters decided that they were going to use mob mentality, go in without masks, yelling and screaming like a bunch of banshees and, uh, fear, and putting fear in the, in, the, uh, in the lives of these people who are trying to make a decent uh, uh, living working in retail, working in restaurants. So I think, you know, what, what the message is, you know, can you imagine going and, and if it was your daughter working at the McDonald's or the Harvey's and some big brute came in and refuse to wear a mask, what awkward position, untenable position does that young woman face? 
uh, these people should think about their actions because uh, they're doing a disservice to the trucking industry, which is vital. The vast majority of people in the trucking industry are, are decent people, but these yahoos are, are ruining their reputation and hurting not only our neighborhoods, but our local economy as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as you said, some people have started to, to leave on their own, but going forward, is there anything you'd like to see done specifically? Is there a role here for police or the federal government? Well, we've had great cooperation with the federal government. Our Ottawa Police Services are obviously working with the RCMP and the Parliamentary Protective Service and the OPP and, and others who have come in, and we appreciate their, their efforts. At the end of the day, as you know, Michael, uh, politicians are not allowed by law to direct operational matters of the of any police service. So I can't tell the police to go in and start towing these, these cars away. But uh, there's no question that the chief uh, monitors the situation literally on an hourly basis, gives reports, and he will make the appropriate decision at the appropriate time as to uh, what will happen with the remaining trucks. Uh, so, you know, I have great confidence in Chief Slowly. He's got 30 years plus experience. Our city, as you know, is used to protests uh, because we're the nation's capital. But this kind of boorish behavior that we've seen, and even attacking journalists, you know, journalists are feeling threatened, trying to do their stand-ups uh, on Wellington Street and on Elgin Street. It's just not acceptable. And I think uh, the organizers should, uh, quite frankly, apologize and move on. And this is costing us, as taxpayers in Ottawa, $800,000 a year uh, just in, in police, or $800,000 a day, I wish it was just a year, uh, of police costs. Plus, uh, you know, they're leaving garbage strewn all over the place. It's going to take days to clean up the, the mess that they've created. And, um, you know, this should not be the cost of, of um, a burden on the, the taxpayers of Ottawa.